Thanks everyone for being here today. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure uh, for me personally and for the school to welcome uh, Senator Eric Berthel here uh, to speak with us today. Uh, Senator Berthel, the Honorable Senator Berthel, has been in the uh, state deep in here, house. Right? <laughs> You've been eight years. eight years in that role here, uh, representing the 32nd? 32nd Senate, yeah. Yes, and uh, is a good friend of the school, a parent of a couple of okay students who are sitting here today. Uh, this is a great opportunity. Uh, as, a, as a lawyer myself, I'm always appreciative of uh, how the process of policy and law gets made. So if you're thinking about anything that involves government, law, public administration, supervision, or just how to deal with groups in a room who do not get along and need to like come together, uh, Senator Berthel is here to talk about all those things. Please uh, take a moment to ask questions and, and yeah. get to know him. And we really appreciate you taking Thank some you. time here today. Uh, and be sure to wish Senator Berthel a happy birthday. <laughs> today is your birthday, correct? So happy birthday, Senator. Thank you. Without Thank further ado, Senator Berthel. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Oh, we got a few more people. Yeah, come on in. Coming down. So, um, so uh, Mrs. Park said they you turn the, or Mrs. Dr. Pellegrino said you turn the air conditioning on. Yeah. It's good to yeah. keep you all awake uh, in case I drone on and you want to fall asleep. Matthew and Paul can fall asleep because they know all of this already and have lived it for a lot of years. But, uh, so listen, it's really uh, great to be here to speak with you today and uh, tell you a little bit about what I do. Um, you know, uh, a lot of people have some misconceptions about what legislators do, about my role. Um, you know, what exactly does a state senator do versus a U.S. senator, things like that. So I thought what I would do in, um, in preparation for this, I was thinking, you know, what, what do I say to you guys that doesn't put you to sleep in like five minutes? You're a bunch of teenagers, you know, you either carved up this morning or didn't eat breakfast, you know, whatever. So I want to I wanna keep it real. Um, if you have a question about something while I'm talking, just raise your hand and, and say, hey, wait a minute, I don't understand that, or hey, I have a question about that, all right? Uh, if you start throwing things at me, I will throw them back, all right? Just so you know, I do have a couple of rotten eggs and a tomato in my back pocket. Uh, I'm kidding. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about me. Um, it is my birthday. I'm 55 years old. Okay. <laughs> a whole other crew coming in. That's great. So uh, I was born in, I'm going to go right there. I'm going to start way back at the beginning. I was born in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, most people say, no way, you don't have a Brooklyn accent. I prefer my Brooklyn on just like that. Hey, what are you doing? Hey, Gennady, what are you doing? Go back to class. You're skipping the class. All right. Um, I came up to Connecticut. I was 10 years old. We moved to Southbury. Okay? And I did have, at 10 years old, I had the thickest New York accent of anyone in New York. And I was living in Southbury, Connecticut. Okay? It was crazy because my friends used to make fun of me all the time. Oh, you talk like you're from New York. I, well, I was, right? So um, I grew up in Southbury. I graduated from Pop Rock High School in 1985. I went on for a bachelor's degree at Manhattanville College, great school, small liberal arts college down in Westchester, about an hour and 10 minutes from here. Uh, I got a bachelor's degree in English. Uh, I thought I was going to be a lawyer. That's what I wanted to do. Um, I will tell you something that I... I uh, I share with, uh, with all young people and with all adults about the study of English and why it's so important. But I'm gonna, I'll get back to that in just a second. I went on after my bachelor's degree to the University of Bridgeport to earn a master's degree. I actually have a master's degree in education, which qualifies me to be a teacher. Right? And at one point in time, I was certified to teach a long time ago. A long time ago, 1990s, because you know I'm 55. That's a long, long time ago. I was born in 1967, right? I remember, I remember when I was a kid, and I would listen to uh, my relatives, my my mom and dad, who are who are 86 and 87 this year, were born in the 1930s. And I remember being a kid when you finally understood how old people were and saying, "Wow, oh, you know, maybe it was 1980 or 1978." 1935, that's a long time ago. I was born in a different century, okay? as were most of your teachers and probably, probably all of your parents. So I went on and got my master's degree. Let me tell you why, um, so I could teach, and I was certified to teach, that's where I left off, in Connecticut, Nevada, and Florida. 
So um, clearly I didn't pursue any of those because I'm still here in Connecticut and I'm not teaching. I taught for one year at Derby High School down in the valley, just south of here. Um, and I went running from that high school building with flames on my feet and said, I'll never go back. I'll never go back into a classroom ever again. I was 23 years old, maybe, 25 years old. I said, I'll never do it again. Now, in addition to a whole bunch of other things that I do that I'm going I'm to lay it all out for you, I teach an English class right down the street at Post University. And here's what I tell my English class students every semester. And it's in part this upon you right now. You can be anything you want to be. Anything. Be a lawyer, a doctor, a teacher, uh, a farmer, the CEO of your own business, a brain surgeon, whatever, a judge, whatever you want to be. You can be whatever you want to be. You put your heart and soul into it and you work hard. If you can't read and write, you can't be any of it. I don't care what your profession is. If you cannot communicate and read and write effectively, you're not going to be good at what you do. I promise you that. I promise you that. You would think being at Post University teaching part-time, by the way, that's not my real job at Post University. That's my part-time job. I teach one class a semester. I just came from there. So three days a week for an hour, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I have kids that come into my class. And I call them kids because all of this, the oldest student in my class this semester is 22 years old. But I've had 70-year-olds in my English class. And when I say that to them, they raise their hand. That 70-year-old person would stand up and say, they call me professor, and I'm really, I really haven't earned the title of professor. They say, Professor Berthel, you are so incredibly correct about that. <laughs> so your other teachers may not like me saying this to you, especially for those of you that aren't graduating in six weeks, for those of you that are still have a few more years to go, English is the most important subject you'll learn here. English. Make sure you're good at English. You want to make sure they learn you good here for English, right? Okay. So, what else do I do? And how did I get involved in the government? How did I end up in the role as a state senator? And what the heck is a state senator? I am not Senator Blumenthal. I'm not Senator Murphy. Yeah, Matt's clapping, and uh, Matt's clapping because he, it's very political, right? Uh, but what else do I do before I get into that? So I work at Post University full time. Not surprisingly, because you know that I'm, I've told you I'm a legislator, I'm in the government, right? I run the governor, government affairs department at Post University. Okay, there's three people in that department, me, myself, and I. Okay, that's it. I run the whole, whole thing. And I rely on some outside help from lobbyists who, if you don't know what a lobbyist is, if we have some time at the end, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But the biggest question that I get, two questions I get, is what exactly does a Connecticut state senator do? Okay, and then probably the one I hear more often than that is, how did you get involved? How did you get to this position? So let me tell you about the second question first, and then I'll tell you about the role kind of a day in the life of, if you will, what happens in my, uh, in any given day. So I'm going to take you on a little journey in a time machine back about 10 years ago. And I want you, for those of you that know Matthew and Paul, I want you to picture them not 17 and 15, but 7 and 5. So take yourselves back to 10 years ago when you were probably about the same age. Right? You guys are all somewhere in that age between 14 and 18 right now. So go back to that point in time. Matthew was, I believe, in the first grade, right? First grade, somewhere in there. And Paul was in preschool, just looking at getting started with kindergarten. And we live in Watertown. For those of you that, um, is anyone here from Watertown besides Matt and Paul? Anyone go through? Uh, put your hand down. Okay, so did you go through uh, John Trumbull or Judson School in, in Watertown? No? You went to St. John's or St. Mary? Okay, so you guys know that uh, Mrs. Scully passed away last week. Um, she was a, uh, a wonderful, wonderful friend of Watertown, was the principal at John Trumbull and uh, Judson, and is a Holy Cross alum, just so you know. Okay. So my wife and I, Matt and Paul's mom, Krista, went up to the school. We're like, hey, let's go. We got. You know, it's first grade, and we wanted to do a, 
a tour of the school again and see what's going on. Maybe it was kindergarten, I don't remember. But we're walking around the school, and this is like two weeks before school starts, so late August, right? And the school looks terrible. There's no supplies. The classrooms are all kind of like not really put together. So I went over to Mrs. Scully, who I've become friends with, and I said, uh, you know, she, her, her first name was, was Kathy. I said, Kathy, what the heck is going on here in this school? Why, is, why does it look like this? It's not ready. And she said to me, Mr. Berthel, in case you haven't been paying attention, we haven't passed the school budget here in Watertown. We are on our fifth referendum. Five times the people had voted on our school budget, and they hadn't passed it in Watertown. And I got angry. Not angry like I was throwing punches angry, but I got vocal. And I was like, that's ridiculous. How do we fix that? My kid's going to be in this classroom. My little kid, my firstborn, is going to be here starting school. And this classroom isn't ready yet? How is that possible? And we went back and forth. And she, in a, in a way that only Mrs. Scully could do, brought some calm to the conversation. And at the end of the conversation, she said to me, you know what, Mr. Berthel? You should run for the Board of Ed. I was like, really? She's like, yeah. She says, you have that. First of all, you're, you're completely invested, right? I have this guy who, imagine him as a kindergartner, for those of you that know Matt, right? Imagine him as this little guy running around and, you know, and then Paul, right? I have these, these little guys running around. And what parent doesn't want the absolute best for their kids, right? Go back and talk, have a conversation with your moms and dads and whoever's in your household when you get home and ask them to take, the, take you back to when you were starting kindergarten and how they felt at that moment. You know, you guys are all in high school now and you're gonna be leaving here at some point, God willing, you'll, you'll have a successful time here at Holy Cross. You're gonna go on to bigger and better things, whether it's college, trades, the military, whatever it is. But at some point, way back when, the person that loves you at home, the people that love you at home, had to, had to put you on a school bus or drop you off somewhere for the first time ever and leave you in someone else's care. And I can tell you that as a parent, that's one of the most painful things to do. And parents that are going to do that again, your parents, for those of you that are seniors and you're gonna go travel to places far away and exotic perhaps to go off to college, your parents are gonna relive that moment again. And I think it's probably even, uh, even more difficult because they, they see you now as adults, not as that little child that they they had to protect, right? When you're a little person, your parents make that like the top priority is making sure you're safe. Not that they don't make, want to make sure you're safe now, but I think you understand where I'm going. So Mrs. Scully says, run for the Board of Ed. Go for it. And I did, and I won. I got elected in November of 2011, 2011 to a four-year term on the Watertown Public Schools Board of Education. I was asked immediately to serve on the executive committee. Executive committee is the chair, vice chair, and secretary. I was asked to serve as a secretary. We had a little change that happened right away, and I became the vice chair and stayed in that role until, um, until my, my next step. Um, and I served as an interim, by, uh, interim chair of the board uh, when, when our, uh, our chair passed away when, when, uh, when I was on that board. So we needed to, needed to fill that in. So, while I'm on the Board of Ed, I'm realizing that the problem isn't really with the town of Watertown. The problem in Connecticut was with our government. And I started having the same kind of conversation I had had with Mrs. Scully with some of our then elected representatives and senators. And they all said to me, well, look, 2014 is coming. Big election, we're gonna reelect the entire state house and state senate, and the district you live in, the person that's uh, running for that seat, is not seeking reelection. So why don't you run for the state house? And well, you kinda of know the answer, I did and I won. Okay? I just, just cut to the chase, right? So I went up to represent the 68th house district. Now, you guys are like, what is he talking about? Now I'm really going to start falling asleep. You're losing me. I'm going into the, into the zone out zone as a teenager. You know, the carbs are burning off. And you're like, oh my God, how much more do I have to take? So let me take a pause before I tell you about the timeout, before I tell you about the rest of what, what being a senator is. What time do I have until again? 
1045? Okay, so, I, so that's about 30 minutes left? All right, good. So let me tell you, I'm going to take you back to what you may have learned in 7th or 8th grade. A little bit of a, of, a, of a review on government. Okay? So you all know what the federal government is. You know that big, those big, beautiful buildings, the two most famous buildings in the world, the White House at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and the United States Capitol. You all know what those buildings are. The White House is where the president lives and where most of the White House activity takes place. The Capitol is where the United States House and the United States Senate convene and conduct their business. You also remember there's three branches of government, executive, judicial, and legislative. The executive branch is the president and his cabinet. The judicial branch is the court system. The legislative branch is your US representatives and your US senators. In the United States, we have 100 US senators, two from each state, regardless of how big the state is. In the House of Representatives, we have 535, I think that's right, it's either 435 or 530, whatever. We have somewhere around, it doesn't matter from, for, if we have the math right. We have about 500 uh, US House representatives, and they are assigned about one per 750,000 people in each state. So in Connecticut, we have 3.6 million, you do the math real quick, we have five US representatives that represent us in the halls of Congress in that big beautiful building on top of that hill in Washington. Okay, the Connecticut system is exactly the same. We call, it a, we call things a little differently, we name them a little differently, and the numbers are a little different. So let me explain to you how that works, because then it's, it, it'll really kind of gel in a moment when, you, when, when I bring it back full circle. So we have an executive branch. That consists of the governor, the lieutenant governor, and all of the constitutional offices, comptroller, treasurer, secretary of state, attorney general. Okay? So that's, that's our executive branch. So in Washington, it's the president, the vice president, and his cabinet members who are not elected. In Connecticut, it's the governor, and then the people that fall under, under the executive. Make sense? Good. Judicial branch, same thing. We have a US Supreme Court, we have a Connecticut Supreme Court. In the United States judicial system, there are different levels of courts, appellate court, circuit court, all those different, and I still, after, after all these years, I still do not understand the, the US court system. I have no idea how it works. No one does, really. They just, they, they find a courtroom and they send it there. Okay. In Connecticut, we have a Supreme Court right across the street from the Capitol. It's not quite as beautiful as the US Supreme Court building in Washington, DC. But then we also have different layers of, 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 of courts. We have the Supreme Court, we have the Superior Court, and then we have a whole bunch of other courts that I, again, don't need to understand because it doesn't really, I just call them and they help me if I need it. And then we have the legislative branch. Now here's where the math gets really difficult. Who's the math scholar in the room? Who, who's the best, the best at math in this room? You're all, you all are. All right, I got who, who up here? Let me come up here. All right, so you, you're the math scholar? All right, so, so I'm going to, is this good for you? Yeah. All right, so in Connecticut, so I told you there's 500 and something U.S. House representatives that represent all 50 states. 500 people for 50 states. In Connecticut, we have 151 state representatives. For one state. What? Why? Doesn't make sense, right? So, do you do math? Do you not do math? Pretty good at math. Right. So, if you divide 3.6 million by 151, what's the answer? Forget it. All right, it's about, forget it, I'm only kidding. <laughs> it's about 27,000, give or take. 25 to 27,000. All right? So, why is that important? Well, the, the, the Connecticut Constitution says that state representatives will represent about 25,000 people in a district. 25,000 people, that's like, you know, one little corner of Waterbury, right? And that's right, Waterbury has five state representatives right here in the city of Waterbury. Why is that so important? Why do we have to drill down to such a small number for state representatives? The legislative branch, whether it's Washington, D.C. or Hartford, Connecticut, Legislators are the voice of the people. So if you have, what town do you live in? Hartford. 
Waterbury. So if you have an issue, something, and what year are you? Uh, junior. You're a junior. So if you have an issue right now, let's just say I'm going to make up a really, really silly issue, okay? Let's say you think that there should be seat belts on school buses, okay? Because uh, you know someone that got hurt in a school bus accident, right? They, they survived, but they got hurt. If you were going to bring that issue and try to get the state of Connecticut government to pay attention to it, the way that I would start, you may not know this, but I would go to your state rep and say, hey, I have a concern. It's my right? dad. It's your dad. Who's your dad? <laughs> That's your dad? Yes, sir. For Pete's sake. Well, then, you know, I'm talking to, the wrong, talking to the right guy. So you would go to your dad and say, DG, I, we, you got to introduce a bill. That's great. Why didn't you tell me that? How, how, how could you guys let me stand here and not know that? That's awesome. Good. Your dad's an awesome guy. Wrong party, but he's, he's uh, a <laughs> So um, and that's the first time I've gone political in, in 28 minutes. So, so, all right, so you understand that. Your dad's one of the state representatives for the city of Waterbury, okay? So about 25,000 people, <coughs> people, not voters, people, residents, citizens, for each state rep, 25,000 times 151 is about 3.6 million. Now here's where the math gets really easy for guys like Matt. <laughs> so Matthew, there's 3.6 million people in Connecticut. There are 36 senators. How many people do we represent? Thank you. Easy math, 33.6 million divided by 36. Matt, has, Matt and Paul have heard this before. So each state senator, state senator represents about 100,000 people in Connecticut. So if you live in Bethlehem, Bridgewater, Middlebury, Oxford, Roxbury, Seymour, Southbury, Washington, Watertown, or Woodbury, anybody live in any of those towns? Ah, a lot of you. I'm your state senator. Hi, nice to meet you. Okay. The other thing I didn't tell you when we started is I am a proud Republican which is kind of a rare, it's kind of like a dodo bird in Connecticut, um, or the, uh, the, the spotted something something that they see one of uh, every, uh, every 10 years somewhere. Um, the, the, the political party doesn't matter for the purpose of our discussion. So now you understand, we have, a, we have 36 state senators, we have 151 state representatives, so we have 187 people that get elected across our state every two years, or re-elected, every two years to be your voice in Hartford. So what does that really mean? And this takes me into what is a day in the life of a state senator all about? So I just told you the towns that I represent. I have 10 towns. About 100,000 people live combined in those 10 towns. What does it mean for me to say to you, or for you to hear your dad say, I'm the voice of the people. So, you know, we know we have politics. We know there's Democrats, Republicans, there's, you know, a bunch of other smaller parties that, that float about, uh, whether at the US level or the state level. But when it comes to representing people, I do not ask, or my legislative aide does not ask in my office in Hartford, she picks up the phone and says, Senator Berthel's office, are you a Democrat or Republican? That is not how we begin the conversation. Doesn't matter. I get elected by party. I happen to represent a very, very conservative red district in Connecticut. But we represent everyone. And being the voice of the people means that if you come to me, where do you live? Middlebury. Middlebury. All right. So uh, do you know what part of Middlebury you live in? Where? What street do you live on? South Street. South Street. So I think I'm actually your senator. It's not Joan Hartley, who's a very good friend of, of the, the school. Her, uh, I think one of her children uh, is an alum of Holy Cross. And, uh, but you could come to either one of us. And, and Senator Hartley's a Democrat, right? And if you had that same issue, that same issue about seatbelts on a school bus, you old enough to vote yet? No. How old are you? 17. Did you register yet? No. When's your birthday? Well, you can go and register to vote right now. Right now. You can leave here. Don't do it right now on your phone. But you can get on your phone and you can register to vote. If you're 17 and a half, you can register to vote and you should. Because okay? there's, there's budget referendums coming up. There's a whole bunch of fun stuff. And there's a big election coming up in November that you want to make sure that you are um, that you're registered for. So 
Being the voice of the people means that you can bring any issue, any issue. Did I misstate that? Is it not 17 and a half? I'm seeing some wrinkling faces out there. All right. Being the voice of the people means that people can, should be able to feel comfortable coming to you and saying, I have an issue. And maybe it's not seatbelts on a school bus. Maybe it's something that, uh, that you need personally. Maybe it's something you're really angry about. Okay? Young people, you're all young people, and the adults that love you and support you here will probably understand this better than you do. But you know, we've seen Connecticut go through a lot of changes that haven't necessarily been uh, in the right direction with respect to our financial situation. You know, your parent, you probably hear your parents talking about the, cap the cost of gasoline being very high right now. And if you guys are driving cars, you're probably not paying for your own gas, someone's paying for it, but someone is paying $4 a gallon for gasoline right now. And some of that, uh, which we're, gonna, we're going to address on Friday, by the way, the cost of gasoline will go, will go down 25 cents on Friday morning. We relax the Connecticut sales tax on gasoline, excise tax, right? So, right now, Connecticut is, in a, uh, is in, a, in a very precarious spot in terms of its financial situation, okay? And I probably get more calls and concerns from people that want to talk to me about taxes, about how expensive it is to live in Connecticut. And sadly, what a lot of them tell me is, they're leaving Connecticut. They're going someplace else. And everyone thinks that every, every person thinks that anyone who's leaving Connecticut is going to go to South Florida. Okay? And a lot of them are, but it's not true. Okay? A lot of people are going to South Florida just because it's warm, right? But it's not true. People are leaving Connecticut to go where it's a little bit more affordable to live. Okay? And that's a, that is a, a, a hard and fast reality of what's going on right now. Okay, but that's probably one of the biggest concerns that I get, is how do we make Connecticut more affordable? And think about your own family situation. So um, we're very blessed in our household. We have three generations. We have Matt and Paul, we have my wife and I, and we have my mom and dad. Right? Three generations, 100 years virtually. Okay? Think about if we had to move. If you had to move away, because your parents say, we can't live here anymore, or we're, we're moving away because your mom's job got moved to Texas, and your mom's going to go, and your family's going to go, your dad's going to go, and your grandma and grandpa, some, one of the, two of them are in Southington, and the other two are over in Fairfield. Think about how hard that is, right? Think about how hard, how difficult that would be of a decision to have to have to leave. Or maybe someone gets to a point where they simply say they can't afford to be in Connecticut anymore. These are the biggest challenges right now, despite all of what you hear on the news, all this rumbling about uh, uh, election fraud, all of these rumblings about, um, you know, uh, whatever, uh, things that are going on in the governor's office right now, people that made mistakes, okay? The real issue, the real priority for everyone up there, regardless of their party, everyone in Hartford is trying to fix Connecticut so that people like you, which is who I'm most concerned about, quite honestly, Dr. Pellegrino is going to retire at some point, and Mrs. Parks is going to retire, and Mr. Pompey is going to retire, and Mr. Santa Maria is going to retire. We're all going to retire at some point. We're all a lot, of, maybe a lot, not a lot older. Some of us are a lot older than, than you. But I'm most concerned about you guys, about you guys. And because of that, the things that I've made my priority and where I've focused my interest in the government is in committees, which I haven't talked about yet. So I serve on the Education Committee in Hartford. I'm the ranking member, which means because I'm in the minority party, Democrats are majority, Republicans are minority by virtue of how many of us are there in each party. Um, I don't get to be called a chair, I'm called a ranking member. Fine. But I'm the ranking member, the ranking Senate Republican on the Education Committee. And the Education Committee in Connecticut deals with K, kindergarten through 12. <coughs> and what I have said countless times, there's 23 committees in the legislature. 
By the way, I, didn't, I, I forgot to mention that before. What we call Congress in Washington, D.C., we call the General Assembly in Connecticut. Same exact thing, just two different names for it. All right? To me, despite these 23 other committees that exist, and the other committees include things like Finance Committee, they decide, <coughs> they decide how we're going to spend the money that the government collects. It's a lot of money. That's billions of dollars. The Appropriations Committee, they decide where we're going to get it from. Where are we going to get it from? Really important. Billions of dollars. The Judici Judiciary Committee, that's where all the lawyers are up there. Dr. Pellegrino, no offense, but that's where all the lawyers hang out, hang out in the judiciary, and they go and tweak the laws. Good, that's what they're trained to do. They should be doing that. And then there's a whole bunch of other committees. I would argue, and I say this all the time, the most important committee in that entire building is education. And here's why. I get to make decisions with my colleagues on what education looks like for kindergarten through 12th grade in Connecticut. Doesn't necessarily directly affect what's going on here at Holy Cross, because this is a, you know, is a, is a private school by definition. But all of those great public schools out there, remember Thomas Jefferson basically invented public schools in, in, in the United States, right? And said this is our highest responsibility as a government to make sure that we educate young people. And we have held true to that promise since the day it was, it was voted upon. There is nothing more important than ensuring that when you were in kindergarten, Mikey, and you started your, your school, that you had the best opportunity. Because it's free. Public school education is free, right? Not free here. We're, you're all here for, for the right reason, because someone said, hey, I want you to be at Holy Cross and have a Holy Cross Catholic education, which is awesome. But the Education Committee of the legislature has the highest charge of any committee. The decisions that we make affect the future of Connecticut, the future generations of Connecticut. Think about how serious that is. If we pass laws that change the delivery of education in our schools, that goes into effect right away, maybe not the next day, but it's changes that take effect. So we have to be very, very serious about what we're doing in that committee and how we change things. If appropriation says, ah, we'll add 10 cents tax over here and 4 cents tax over there, who cares? It's gotta be paid for somehow, right? If, we're gonna, if we made a decision to spend it. If we make a decision to take out let me make a really dumb example. We're not going to teach math anymore. We have made it, and this is, this is make-believe. I'm not saying we did this. We're going to rule, we're going to pass a bill, we're no longer teaching math. Math is useless. You don't need math. Okay, you got an iPhone with a calculator and you're good. Think about how damaging that would be. You're not going to teach math. Or, let me go really, really awful. We ain't not going to teach no English no more. Connecticut ain't teaching English. All done. Bye bye. See ya. Good luck. Go ahead. So potentially you could remove homework? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Good question. What grade are you? Freshman. Freshman. All right. Uh, the question was potentially we could remove <laughs> homework. So we actually, no, we would never remove homework. You have to have homework. But I tell, I'll tell you one of the pieces of legislation that's before us right now. And this gets into a little bit of what do I do every day. So I do not, and I'll answer your question in a minute, I'm going to give you an example of, that has to do with recess. Remember recess? You used to go outside and run around, kick a kick ball around, maybe, you know, throw some dirt at someone if you were mad at them, whatever. You know, whatever, you know, whatever little kids did in recess, right? There's a bill to change recess uh, right now that's really very disturbing, right? But let me take, before I answer that, People say to me, do you go to Hartford every day? No, I do not go to Hartford every day. Thank God. Thank God for, the, for small things. Most of the work that I do as a, as a state senator is done in the towns that I represent. In the towns that I represent. So as an example, 
Saturday night, I had to be at a dinner to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Woodbury Ambulance Association. Okay? Awesome stuff. I'm a former EMT from way back when. Okay? I go to Eagle Scout ceremonies. I go to all these things that are part of the community, the fabric of what makes up the district that I represent. And that's the most important part of what we do. The stuff we do up there in Hartford, over there in Hartford, which way is Hartford? That way. Uh, the stuff we do up there, by the time we get to it, and we're actually in, and you can have this time, you can ask your dad this when you, when you see him later. By the time we get to the conversation, excuse me, in that big, beautiful Capitol building in Hartford, and we have the most beautiful Capitol building in the country, state Capitol building, arguably, wins awards every year. If you've never been, let's get you up there and, and we'll do a tour, we'll, we'll figure out some way to do that if we, if we can. I don't know if we can make that happen before the end of the year, but let's get, let's get you up there if you've never been, all right? But the things that we do when we're in the Senate chamber or his dad's in the House, in, in, down in the House chamber, by the time we get it to the floor and we're, we're debating it, it's pretty much done. It's pretty much done. Not that we can't change minds and whatnot and, and, and maybe change an outcome, but pretty much if we're voting on something in the Senate chamber or the House chamber in Hartford, it's going to pass. I may vote against it, and all of my Republican colleagues may vote against it, but if we vote on it, if they call it, as we say, and we hear it, it's going to pass. But let me talk to you. So removing homework, no. You need to have homework. You need more homework, actually, I would say. Add more homework. Thank God you can't vote yet, right? What town do you live in? Prospect? OK, so you couldn't vote for me if you, if you were old enough. Homework's important. It helps your teachers to understand that you're actually studying and learning what they need you to learn. But there is a bill to actually, listen carefully, there is a bill to actually use the removal of recess time as punishment. Sorry. How do you feel about that? How do you feel about that? So you go, Mr. Pompey, yes, um, how do you feel about that? You taught in a public, you were a, 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 an administrator in a public school, you're in high school though, right? Correct. So you didn't have recess in, in, at, at Naughty Noggy High, right? I mean, so um, how do you feel about that as a principal now? Should, should recess be used to, as, a, as a, a, a penalty, taking it away? What do you think? You want to think about it? No, I can't answer that. Um, the problem is that the, the time for most of your um, most rambunctious children who can be a little bit restless in a classroom environment and therefore yeah. leads to uh, disciplinary consequences for their disruptive behavior in class, for most of those students, the time in recess is the time for them to expend a lot of that energy yeah. and sort of reset themselves for the day and, and have that outlet. So by taking that away, it's almost counterproductive in terms of behavior. Yeah, thank you. And that was a, that was a, very, a very properly worded answer from a, 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 an experienced and well-versed administrator. So basically saying, that kid who's causing all the trouble in the class, let him go run around and get some of that energy out. And, he'll, and, he, and maybe he or she, I think you said a he, but, so we'll leave it as a he, but he or she would, will maybe get some of that energy out and behave. Right? Mike. All, all three of us went to the same elementary school and we would get our recess. Yeah, we were like into that. Yeah, so, so there was a, there was a, and, and I, I think I know where you all went to school, but um, so there was a, uh, there used to be a local decision to allow that to happen. Okay? And now there's a lot of advocates sworn against this. Some advocates feel that using recess and taking it away, the threat to a fifth grader to not be able to go outside and release that energy is going to make them behave. I got a problem with it, and I won't support it. So, yes? Uh, from experience, where recess has been taken away from me, it actually, it actually doesn't help at all. It doesn't it makes it worse, right? Yeah, it makes it, it worse. Yeah. Okay. So, I'm not surprised to hear all of you say that as, um, as young people. Okay? My concern with it is, first of all, there are laws in place that say you can't do this right now. You can't. There's laws in place right now that say you can take away a, a portion of recess for... Uh, I think you're supposed to be allowed 20 minutes, whatever, whatever. I don't have the, the info in my head right now. 
uh, but they want to make that so that they can take away the entire recess block and use it as a form of punishment. I think that's terrible, terrible idea, terrible. And some of you are living proof that it, that it's not not a good idea. What did you do? You want to share? I was just very talkative. Talking. I know. I have that you problem. Did a lot. I know. That. Yeah. You did a lot. So, um, so let me tell you a little bit more, real quick, because we're running out of time, and I, I want to leave a couple of minutes for questions. Okay? Are we five minutes? So, so here's one thing I want to make sure you, you leave with. <laughs> your your uh, your adults will appreciate this. That support you here. I am not Senator Blumenthal or Senator Murphy. Okay? I am not. And I can tell you, we get calls. I'll, I'll touch base with my legislative aide in my office, and she'll tell me that she got four or five calls today, people calling me about how I'm going to vote on bills that are in Washington, D.C. It's a very common mistake that people make. And I'll run into people in the supermarket. Why did you vote to support blah, blah, blah in Washington last week? I'm like, I, 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 it wasn't me. Yes, it was. You're, la you're, you're uh, Blumenthal. Oh, no, God. Good God. No, I'm not. Senator Blumenthal, I am your state senator, but I'm not your U.S. senator. I do not go to Hartford every day. You'll see me more in the 10 towns that I represent, just like your dad doesn't go to Hartford every day. Your dad's a, a, a terrific police officer here in the city of Waterbury, doing, a, doing a, a great job. His dad's a cop here in Waterbury, <coughs> and you should be uh, thanking police officers when you see them for the work that they're doing right now. Very important. So. Um, let me open it up for questions. So I really don't have, so my answer is I don't have a schedule that I go to every day where I have to be with the governor at 9 o'clock or the secretary of state at 10.30 or whatever. It's a, it's a really uh, eclectic calendar on any given day. I could be doing committee meetings on Zoom like we've been doing for the last two years, or we could be called in for a session day where we're actually in the Senate chamber and we're voting on bills. Or it could be nothing. I don't have to do anything as a, as a state senator. All right, questions. Anyone have any questions? Ask me anything you want, and, and as long as it's not inappropriate, I'll answer. Anything. Paul, you have a oh, Yes. How often do you like go to like events for like towns that you like support or like gatherings of like people who like need you there? On average, I'd say probably three or four times a week. That's a, that's a, one of the largest parts of the job. Okay? And and when I was in the house, I only had Waterbury, I only had Watertown and a little piece of Woodbury, so it was a lot less frequent. But um, with 10 towns, there's a lot of stuff going on all the time. You know, and you know, I, I used to make the joke, if someone invited me to the opening of an envelope, right, that if, they, if they, they were asking me to be there, it was important enough for them to ask me that I should go. That's being a good public servant. So it's a great question. Anyone else? Yes? What would you say is the most like, enjoyable moment you had to like, experience as a representative? Most enjoyable moment as a as a legislator. Wow, that's a good question. Um, you know, to me, one of the things that we get to do kind of ties into into the question about where what do I do um, is when I have the when I have the the true privilege to bring someone up to Hartford and to introduce them in the Senate chamber on the floor of the Senate. The, the Senate floor is restricted. It's only members, elected members, and, and our staff. So if, if you're being, what town do you live in? Oh, Waterbury. In Waterbury. So I, w I wouldn't necessarily recognize you, but Senator Hartley might, right? So you've done something. You, you're an Eagle Scout, whatever. Whatever it is, you, you raised money for, for a charitable cause. She brings you up to, the, up to the Senate and brings you on the floor. You can't be on that floor unless you're, you're there with a member. And then she stands up for a few minutes and says some wonderful things about what you've done. To me, it's not about pushing the red or the green button to vote on stuff. It's about recognizing the successes and accomplishments of people in, in the community. That's really cool stuff. Okay? And, uh, and I'm fortunate, we have a lot of cool stuff that goes on in my district, and we bring people up. COVID has kind of slowed us down a little bit, obviously, but, um, but that's, that's the most enjoyable part of the job. The worst part of the job is trying to figure out how we're, going to, how we're going to get guys like you and the rest of you to stay in Connecticut when you finish your college careers or, or whatever it is that you do when you leave uh, Holy Cross. So, Mr. Pompey stood up. It must be the end of the, the block. Just get ready, sir. All right. Any other questions? Yeah. Mr. Uh, Dr. Pellegrino. With, uh, thank you for this, by the way. This has been great. With families leaving Connecticut, um, 
is there something that schools can do, public or private schools in the state of Connecticut, to help kind of slow that migration down? Yeah, so uh, very quickly, I, it's a more of a less direct answer to that, and, and you just made me think of something that I wanted to talk about. When you have an issue, and certainly you guys do a great job here, you know, we, we've, we communicate on stuff, I know you communicate with your other state legislators as well. You guys have, I, I talked about that, that I'm your voice in Hartford. If you have something you want to say, say it. Advocate. If you don't know what the word advocate means, look it up. Be a voice for the things that you're passionate for. I don't care what it is. If the government can help you get it done, then reach out to your elected officials and ask them to help you. Advocate for the things you want. There was an issue here last year where they wanted to take away, this is really, really drilling down, very granular. They wanted to take away the school nurse for Holy Cross, provided for the city of Waterbury, correct? They wanted to take that away. So let's just say hypothetically that the school nurse makes $10 an hour, okay? Let's just say. They wanted to put all of the responsibility for hiring the school nurse. Do you pay for the school nurse now? I don't even know. I don't no. know. We, uh, we do not. You do not, okay. So that's a benefit that is extended through the public school system to the, the private parochial schools, okay? They wanted to take that away. So that means now that your school, which you know relies upon your tuition, relies upon an incredible auction, fundraising, all the stuff that you guys and your parents and we're all involved with to keep Holy Cross healthy, right? Keep it healthy and help it survive and enrollment and more students coming in. Thanks for what Mrs. Parks does, right? All of a sudden, they want to take that away and put that cost on the school. So we worked very hard to prevent that. Your leaders reached out to me and said, hey, you got, what's going on? Why are we doing this? There was also talk about, uh, about school buses as well. Remember, we want to take away the school bus. The school buses are running around. They, 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 they come here for people who live in Waterbury, students who live in Waterbury, they, they're here anyhow. Why would we all of a sudden want to take that away and put that cost on to your school? So these are the kind of things that they're working on. Okay? And kind of doesn't really answer your question, but advocacy. If you're annoyed about something, you're happy about something, you're angry, you really want something to change. Call your legislator and talk to them. Send them an email. Advocate. Let your voice be heard. I don't know if you're annoyed about something unless you reach out to me and say, hey, Senator Bertel, how do you feel about this? And I may come back to you and say, you know what? I can't help you with that. I'm totally on the opposite side of that. But let me, let me point you to who could. Or let's talk about it and let's see if there's, if there's maybe there's lack of understanding on my part about what you're really passionate about. But advocacy is huge. It's huge. All right, I think they, they tell me the sand has run out of the time glass. We're done. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all for being here.